My name is Katrina Weir and I work for the Fragile X Association of Australia. I'm here with Dr Marsha Braden, who's in Australia as a guest of the Association and the Fragile X Alliance. Dr Braden is a world-renowned psychologist specialising in children and adolescents and she works extensively with people with Fragile X syndrome and autism. She is a former teacher and an expert in education and behaviour management strategies, techniques and interventions. We're very privileged to have Dr Braden in Australia as there is a high demand for her skills and expertise right around the world. Since she's been in Australia, she's been the keynote speaker at workshops for families affected by Fragile X and professionals working with people with Fragile X in both Melbourne and Sydney. And she's also run clinics for families in both cities. She's agreed to participate in this Q&A video so that people who are unable to attend the workshops or clinics can have access to her vast wealth of knowledge and experience. Welcome, Dr. Braden. Thank you. So I'd like to start by quickly just explaining to you how we've arrived at the questions that I'm going to ask you today. We contacted our member database and we offered them the opportunity to submit questions that they would like you to answer for them. And then we also incorporated some of the questions that were asked at the Melbourne and Sydney workshops mm -hmm. because we felt people who were asking questions in those situations, there will be other people who have very similar questions and could benefit from your responses to that. And loosely we've divided our questions under the two headings of your main areas of expertise, behaviour and education, but I'd like to start by asking you a much more general question. So we know that there are links between Fragile X and autism and that many children with Fragile X syndrome experience autism. What differentiates autism and Fragile X syndrome with regards to the educational and behavioural strategies that you might use? Great question and I know we answered this many times over and have in the States as well. So the, the main difference really is that um, clinically speaking one uh, group definitely presents with the DNA, and, and that's the Fragile X group. The autism diagnosis is made simply by looking at behavioral characteristics and ticking off boxes related to how the child responds. So you can, in fact, have an individual who has Fragile X syndrome and also meets the diagnostic criteria for autism. Now, looking at the treatment, however, is a little different in that we know that there's a specific etiology for those individuals with Fragile X. The etiology for those on the autism spectrum um, varies. And uh, again, that, that makes things a little bit different in terms of our educational and behavioral strategies. Mm -hmm. So we would be looking at the behavioral strategies, really taking in the etiology, meaning the neurobiological markers that we know to be true of those with Fragile X syndrome. And we would want to look at how they learn the same way. We would want to look at what cognitive strengths they have, how we've studied that based on their neurobiology, and again, kind of match that up with intervention strategies related to education. So we would be looking at, in terms of behavior, we'd be looking at ways that we might be able to um, sort of reduce the aggressive behavior by replacing behaviors with those that were more adaptive. We would watch the child sort of go through and tell us what they need. For example, if the child is covering their ears a lot during a no noisy situation, that would mean that the child needs to be away from that situation in order for them to learn. So we would develop strategies based on that, that maybe there would be times that we'd want to desensitize them to the noisy environment, and other times where maybe they'd wear the headsets, and they would be able to make it through that situation. In terms of the educational piece, you'd want to be sure that you look at their motor planning deficits. Not all kids with autism have those deficits, mm -hmm. but with Fragile X, many do. And you want to be careful about what you would be asking them to do as far as puzzles and writing and those kinds of things, because those could be triggers for behaviors in the long run. And in, in essence, they're saying to us, I don't know what to do, or I can't do it, I'm frustrated. And so they might pick up their pencil and throw it, and that would be a way for us then to look at what do we need to do differently to get them to be able to write their name, to get them to be able to stamp something, to get them to be able to color something. And so in the big picture, we really have a lot more information that's available, available to us through the etiology of those with Fragile X than we do those with autism. 
There is a behavioral intervention strategy that we use called Applied Behavioral Analysis, ABA, that many individuals with Fragile X benefit from. Mm -hmm. There are others who do not because it's a very direct sort of teaching. Um, and we know that these individuals are really plagued with anxiety and that they get very nervous when they're put out uh, in front of people and have to give an answer very quickly. That's really the underpinnings of ABA. So we would want to kind of adjust that in a way that they could maybe still benefit from the structure of it, but the, the delivery method would be different. Thank you. I know it's a question that a lot of, a lot of people have, uh, are very interested in, so thank you for that. So I'd like to move on to some of the questions that people have asked us specifically around behaviour. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's start with how, how important is the physical environment for people with fragile X? Really important because it is so much easier to fix the environment than the child. So I always tell everyone uh, in teaching or parents at home, you know, if you can restructure the environment in a way that makes more sense, has some good visual cues, has some good reminders um, in terms of what they're to do next, it really is very helpful. We do know that there's a lot of research that's been done related to uh, the structure of the classroom, the intervention in the classroom, uh, and how that affects the outcome of the child. And so again, it's, it's really tried and true that if you can, in fact, structure that environment to be predictable, to make sense to the child with Fragile X, to be uh, an environment that is um, really very structured and in place and reliable to that child, um, then they're going to do a lot better. So then we don't have to do as much intervention with the child. Okay. So we hear a lot about people with Fragile X having heightened senses, such as mm. smell and touch and sound and even vision in some cases. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and, and some of the ideas that you've got to help manage that? Yeah, and I, I think really what we know the most about it related to the sensory system is that they have a real difficult time modulating what's coming into their system. So um, when they hear something, it may sound very different to the, the child with Fragile X than it would to someone without Fragile X. When they see something or something is flickering or something sort of is in their way or even to be touched, um, they, they don't translate that well. They don't really interpret that sense of touch um, in a way that makes a lot of sense. And so what it does, it really provokes more anxiety because they're not interpreting what's coming into their sensory system. And we know we're bombarded with that all the time. Uh, they have a great deal of difficulty managing that. We call that regulation. We call that the ability to maybe be able to look at something and inhibit certain aspects of, of the visual input, for example. Whereas a, a person with Fragile X may fixate on that visual, may fixate on the sound, uh, may fixate on the touch. And so they're not available for instruction mm -hmm. because they're fighting so much uh, to sort of regulate that incoming noise, that incoming sound, uh, that they can't focus on what we're trying to teach them. So it's a critical element. It sort of gets them ready to learn when we've allowed them to have some sorts of um, Oh, methods or even techniques that might quiet that down or help them interpret it in a way that's more appropriate. Of course, an occupational therapist would be the one to consult for specific strategies around that. But we know that it's, it's critical to understand that and not to ask that child in a noisy environment, if we're seeing lots of this or we're seeing lots of hand flapping, not to ask that child to attend to a learning instruction when in fact we haven't addressed the sensory issues. And would that apply to adults with Fragile X as well? It really, really does. Um, I think if we've done our work well and the child has been um, available for early intervention and those kinds of things, that sorts out eventually for the adult. But when we have adults that haven't been diagnosed until they're teenagers or even adults, that's still happening, uh, certainly that is an aspect that interferes with their ability to access the community, um, to really be, be employable. Uh, to be able to um, really concentrate and focus on vocational tasks. And so we would definitely want to address that as well with adults. Mm. Well, you mentioned anxiety uh, in your response there, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit more specifically. And I, I, I understand that anxiety can impact on every area of every person's life, right. but it is one of the key difficulties for people with Fragile X. 
Can you talk to us a little bit about that and, and any tips or advice you would have for, for parents or carers managing or helping people reduce their anxiety? Yes, I think anxiety, you're right. Um, that seems to be one of the neurological in underpinnings that seems to just rear its ugly head often with this population. And even though at times they don't look nervous or they don't look anxious, they may be able to sort of regulate that enough to stuff it. But then later on they may become really angry or pound the, their fist against a wall after something has happened to them that's been very anxiety provoking. And I hear from parents often, you know, I don't think they're anxious, and yet you see them chewing on their sleeve or you see them chewing their collar. That's a big sign of anxiety. They're trying to regulate and get a different outcome. So chewing tends to calm anxiety. And um, those are the things that they really are plagued with. And I feel like so many of them are trapped in, into this body of being very anxious and afraid. Uh, frightened about what's happening. That's why they ask over and over again, and next, and next, and next. They want to know what's on their schedule. They want to know what's happening next, because that then in, in, in uh, essence really calms them. So not knowing what's coming next, not understanding the contract, so to speak, not understanding what you're asking from them, is very anxiety provoking. And we miss it sometimes, because we might just see that as a straight out behavior. So the child is asked to do something, but really what he's saying to us is, this makes me really anxious because I don't understand what the expectation is. Instead what he does is he tears up the paper or he throws the pencil, and you're stuck with, well, he's just trying to get out of this activity, or he doesn't want to participate, or he's lazy, or some of the things that, that typically are, are um, familiar to teachers oftentimes in that situation. And in essence, really what he's doing is he's trying to say to us, I'm really scared or I'm really anxious. We get into the fight or flight sort of uh, response pattern often with this population. And so what they're doing is trying to figure out a way to get out of something that's very anxiety provoking. Not that they want to be naughty and not that they want to misbehave, but they really are afraid of what's going on in the environment. And so they've learned that if they respond a certain way, they may be timed out, for example. They may be given a different option or, or something done to get them out of that activity. So they tend then to follow up the anxiety with a behavior that sort of rescues them from that particular situation that's mm -hmm. so anxiety provoking. So as a teacher or as a parent or as a carer, what are some of the ways that you might be able to help that person manage their anxiety? I think observing is really important. Um, and not just basically thinking that it's a behavior, isolated behavioral incident. To look back on the antecedent, the thing that happened before you see the behavior. If that antecedent is laden with lots of activity, lots of uncertainty, uh, a schedule change, for example, a routine change, chances are what you're getting is an anxious response. So clearly what we need to do in that situation is to manipulate that antecedent. We want to make sure that we've been very good at telling them exactly what's coming in their schedule. We want to make sure if there's a change to prep them ahead of time mm -hmm. uh, by introducing a question mark, for example, and that then is their sort of symbol that alerts them to think, okay, there's something different that's going to happen today, and I can prepare myself for that. I can handle it. I can live through that because I've been taught that I can, I can manage it. So those are the things that are really important. We go back to even the environment, where the predictability of the environment, the predictability of the schedule, those are things that will all reduce anxiety. That's excellent, thank you. So what is likely to trigger an outburst or a meltdown in people with Fragile X? And, and again, what are some strategies to help avoid these situations? So it, sometimes it's kind of tricky. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes we don't really know exactly what the triggers are because um, it may have been a trigger that happened an hour before the behavior, which really is very difficult. But it may have been something that happened, let's say, on the bus coming into school and that there was a lot of commotion and there was a lot of maybe arguing or maybe there were loud noises that had nothing to do with the individual with Fragile X, not involved in the conflict at all. But the observation of that and the fear created as a result of that confrontation or the loud noise may have in fact gotten to that child and when they got into the classroom, all of a sudden we have a meltdown. So it's very difficult to do this unless you've got a good log ahead of time in terms of what's happened. We go back to that antecedent again. 
sometimes, I mean, I mean really a very classic, um, I think, trigger is the change in routine. I think a lot of times that really is something that throws these individuals and not preparing them enough for a change in routine or if we're going somewhere for the first time, having a picture of it ahead of time, walking them through in terms of a story of what's going to happen. So we're going to go into this park and we're going to see this apparatus and then we're going to slide a couple of times and then we're going to get our picnic out and we're going to have a lunch. Those are the things that are going to settle them down rather than just show up at the park and all of a sudden we're in a strange environment and we're having to put two and two together and it's not adding up to four at all. So again, I think a lot of that change in routine, not being prepared for an activity, um, not understanding an expectation, making it very clear what's expected, how much time we're going to be there. So we use a first-then board. First we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this. That helps a lot because they understand, I'm not going to have to be here swimming around not knowing what I'm doing for hours at a time. I might have to do it for a little bit, but right after that, the first is this, but the then is something I'm familiar with. I can calm down enough because I'm constantly focusing on the then. So I think that's really the, the most important uh, message here is to make sure that we prepare them for things that are coming. Well, certainly there's some very clear links between anxiety and behaviours mm -hmm. that, that teachers and carers and parents might, might be experiencing. Yes. And we also know that, you know, people with fragile X experience a lot of difficulty transitioning mm -hmm. from, from one situation to another. Uh, your example of going to the park or, or moving from the car to school or a change in the workplace schedule, just as you've been talking about. What, do you, what advice do you have around managing transitions? Well, of course, going back to what we just talked about, and that is being prepared and preparing the, the person for the transition. There's also a really nice little strategy that seems to work um, universally, and that is just giving them a job to do. So that when that transition occurs, they have a ball to take into the PE class, or they have something to deliver to the office and then go across the hall to the other teacher. So having something in place that makes a job, kind of a special job, takes their mind off the transition. We know that transitions are difficult because a lot of times the child is worried or the adult is worried about what's on the other side of the threshold. What am I going to be leaving that's familiar to go across the hall? Am I going to have a lot of, witness a lot of noise in the hallway? Is somebody going to be running down the hallway and accidentally touch me? Because that happened yesterday, so I'm already worried about that. So if we have something in our hand or a job to do or some delivery to make, we can focus on that and that job and not worry so much about that transition. So this transitional object that I've written a lot about, and of course you can go to my website and pull it off um, to, to look at, I think the name of that particular article was um, Have Object Will Transition. So again, having something to take with them mm -hmm. to help with that transition usually works. And you can make it work for the place they're going. For example, if they're going to the lunchroom, they can carry down or pull a wagon with the lunch, lunch buckets in it. If it's going to a PE class, they can take a ball along and deliver it to the PE teacher. So it makes sense, sort of goes with the activity, but it gives them something else to focus on. And I guess that would apply in the workplace, so for adults involved in community activities as well? It does. And I mean, one of the things that we really have found works really well, I mean, we've used the visual schedules for years with kids. Uh, at schools, but we've now found that it works wonderfully um, for the vocational side of things. So that when they get in the door, they may come in and they go right to their locker. So that's kind of they're carrying in their coat or they're carrying in their backpack, and that's their transitional object. It gets them in the door and they put it in their locker. They immediately on their locker now can look to see, go to the visual schedule. The visual schedule will tell them what they need to do during the day, what tasks they're going to be doing. They're ticking that off so they know every time after they finish one they can come back and tick it off. So yes, that's a very good strategy to just continue throughout the lifespan. Fantastic. So just onto something a little bit specifically for children perhaps, it's sleep disturbance. Mm. And we know that's also a common problem for a lot of people with fragile X. Is this something that changes over time from childhood to adulthood? And, and what can people do to facilitate good sleep patterns? Yeah, 
Yeah, and that's so important because we have a compromised neurobiological system anyway. And so without sleep, all of us know when we've gone without sleep, we're pretty cranky and we don't, our yeah. cognitive uh, ability is, is really impaired a lot of times when we've gone without speak, sleep for a long period of time. So we know in this population it's particularly difficult. Um, parents will report that it's difficult to settle in. Um, and then some other parents will say that the child wakes up with night terrors later on. And, and it, it causes them then sleep de deprivation because they're trying to help the child soothe and get the child back to bed. And sometimes the parents give in to it and just bring the child into their bed. Then we have that to undo. And you can imagine it's just a, a, a cycle there. So the first thing to think about, and there are a number of sites on the National Fragile X Foundation site related to um, sleep. And, and kind of some ways around getting around that. So I would refer people to that for specifics. But we do know overall that if the settling is in is the problem, that um, a lot of the kids tell us when they're older, you know, bedtime was difficult for me because everything was shutting down at that time of day. That the lights were going down and people were getting quiet and they were all going into their own rooms and I'm kind of sitting there in my room all by myself and it was hard for me, or it was scary for me. So I think we can transcend that back then to the child that's very young that can't tell us that, but simply is telling us that through their behavior. So you would want to do things like have a specific bedtime routine in place. That, again, is reassuring. That is just calming the waters before they have to settle in. So it's not going from, we're doing all this fun activity, and all of a sudden it's bedtime and you're in bed. That's too much of a change in terms of the activity level. And so we would want to start in with maybe a warm bath, dinner, warm bath. Then we might want to bring them into, some people have like slings and swings that they can swing their children in, something that's kind of calming to that direction, or maybe a rocking chair, or maybe even just kind of calming them in bed, some massaging, just bringing things down. We have lamps in the U.S., I'm sure they have them here as well, that you set according to daytime, nighttime. And so it starts to get darker and darker in the room as the ticker goes off as far as the time frame. And that way it kind of readies the body. Um, some kids are good with very nice classical music. Some kids are alerted by that. So you have to kind of know your child. But we recommend that as well. And then the massaging, sometimes some uh, oils like lavender or something um, that might be in the room, so that's a calming agent. And so what you're going to do is work them through this little schedule so that they take the warm bath and then they might swing and then they get a massage and then they get a story and then they're going to bed so it's lights off. And you can kind of time that so that your timer on your clock and your, and your lamp goes down just about the time that you finish the story. And so everybody's kind of calm at that point and you go into your room and, and you let the child um, get to sleep. And it just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of um, repeated exposure to this sort of you know, transition. Um, if your child wakes up in the middle of the night, sometimes we have individuals who worry because of the anxiety, but they can't really tell us that. So they might scream out something that they're worried about, or they may relive their day, and, and they're sort of talking about what happened during their day. So a lot of times, just listening to that and kind of understanding it will allow us to maybe have a social story. And the social story would be read before bedtime so that we could go through what happened that day. Now to do that, we need help from the teacher because the teacher would tell us kind of what went on during the day. It doesn't need to be anything bad, but we did this and then we did this and we did... That can be the story. So the ch child kind of talks and relives that story without having to do it later on I at night. Uh, they have a very strong startle response, so if there's any noise that goes off, they're immediately going to be alerted. We know that they don't return to baseline as quickly as children that are typically developing, so we're going to need more of that deep pressure and calming in order to get them back to sleep. Uh, what we don't want to do is get into the habit, because what we talked about at the lectures was there's a neurobiological condition, and our response to it really makes that child's behavior continue. So that consequence of, oh, poor you, maybe you need to come into my bed, that could be prolonging this problem, because the comfort and the relationship and all of what goes on in mommy's bed with me right there hugging all the time mm -hmm. is really wonderful. Why would I change my behavior? So I know now if I wake up in the middle of the night, she's going to come in, she's going to soothe me, she's going to take me back to bed because she's tired of being up all night long. We don't want to do that. And it's hard not to do, I understand that. But you really set something up to continue for a long period of yeah. time. 
And, and do sleep patterns tend to change over time as, as children grow into well, adolescence? Well, yes, I think so, because they kind of understand how to regulate the, their system. Okay. So they may, in fact, put on headsets, or they may, in fact, read um, to calm themselves down, or do something in their schedule that they know kind of gets them ready. I would strongly suggest against doing any sorts of, um, you know, TV watching, within the hour before it's bedtime or lights are out or doing any kind of um, electronic game mm -hmm. because that's a very highly stimulating uh, system and we, we really want not to do that before someone's settling in to sleep. Yeah. And, and the other issue a lot of parents grapple with is, is toilet training mm -hmm. uh, and some children with Fragile X do experience great difficulties with this. What are some factors that contribute to it? A and again, what ideas have you got to help? This is really an important one because if a person is not toilet trained, often the doors close to them. So that um, you even hear this like in a middle school, for example, which is our grade six through eight, something like that, that um, they can't be included with the typical kids if they're wearing nappies or they're wearing diapers. Okay, yeah. Um, and so, and, and you can understand that because it's a safety issue, there's a lot of germs, a lot of contamination, those kinds of things. And just socially, it's very difficult. Um, so we want to do this as early as we can. There is, however, the neurobiology that relates to the connective tissue disorder and some of the muscle tone that causes them not to be able to really um, control their bowels, for example. For example, the sphincter muscle in their bowel. Um, that is not always developed till later on, just like the, the rest of their muscle tone. And so for them to get the sensation to close that sphincter so that they're not having bowel movements um, in their pants, for example, or, or their trousers, that is, is kind of a developmental piece that we have to make sure that's in place. Otherwise, we're going to drive them crazy and ourselves at the same time, trying to, trying to get them to that point. We also know, and there, again, National Fragile X Foundation has a, a consensus paper on this, so they can, the audience can Google um, toilet training, and it will tell them different methods to use. One of the things that they really focus on in this consensus paper is they need to be dry for two hours. Because if they're, they're not, then obviously they're not regulating the urine and they're not able to understand the sensation that's created from wetting. So you're really putting your head against a brick wall at that point. So if you see that going on with your child and you also see that they're pulling on themselves when they're wet, that tells you they're understanding that sensation. Mm -hmm. They're starting to feel wet and it feels funny or they're recognizing it. Then it's time to try. And again, you know, urine training is much easier um, oftentimes than bowel training. Uh, but again, we would want to start with those things being kind of on the list of checking it off. Ah, we're ready. And then you're going to do something that allows them to go um, on, a, on a schedule. So you kind of watch when they're wet and you're kind of looking at, well, it's about every two hours. Or we notice that when they're playing during the day, it's not as often as at nighttime when they're getting ready to go to bed. So you look at that and that becomes your schedule. So you want to be proactive. So if they're wedding at 8 and 10, you want to take them in at 7.30, 7.45 and hope you grab it right there instead of waiting till they've wet and then trying it at, at 8.15, for example. Yeah. So those are some of the strategies yeah. that we use. Okay. Well, we know that people with fragile X can develop very, very strong interests in things, and, and sometimes that's actually to the point of obsession. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if this becomes a problem, what sort of strategies would you suggest? So we want to go back to the cause. The cause and the etiology is related to the anxiety, because when we repeat patterns or interests or rituals, we know that that's how we're dealing with anxiety. It kind of helps us feel like we're in control, that we can do whatever we need to do to bring ourselves into sort of this structured environment that we talked about earlier. So again, that's kind of the reason for it. We usually intersperse other things so that the child or the adult is learning something related to the obsession but they can add on to it. So they can talk about something else. For example, 
if it's a movie star, and this happens a lot with the adults, uh, the girls tend to kind of get fixated on certain movie stars, as do normal teenagers, right? right. But, um, you know, they, then we can kind of expand that and go into the movie, for example, that they were last in, and let's look at this character and that character, and let's see what other movies they played in. So it's not just about Phantom of the Opera or something like this, that we can expand that. It's really critical, I think, too, to understand the etiology. Because if we're fighting biology all the time, and that's really what it is, it's a, it's a byproduct of anxiety, and don't address the anxiety, we might be able to put the lid on a little bit in terms of those interests being perseverative, but we're really not getting to the core, the, the, the reason that it's happening. So once again, can we do some calming activities? Can we do some deep breathing? Can we look at the fact that we can explain to the child, you know what? This is what happens when you get anxious. I've noticed that you start repeating or talking about the same thing. Let's do some deep breathing, and then let's talk about three other things first. So again, just trying okay. to kind of help them through that situation without basically saying you can't do it at all. Because the more you say you can't do it, the more they're going to obsess over it. Yeah. That's <coughs> funny. Well, thank you very much for, so, for sharing your experience around some of the behavioural issues that we've talked about. Is, is there anything that we've left off in terms of some of the key behavioural well, challenges? Well, not really, except one really important thing, I think, for the audience to hear is that these individuals respond to their own neurobiology, um, and they're not naughty kids. They're not kids that like to get into trouble. They're not kids that want to act out on purpose to get even with someone or to get back at someone. Most of the behaviors that we see occurring are really a reaction to what's going on in their neurobiological system. And they really have no other way to express it but through behavior. If their language you know, is delayed, then clearly they're going to hit us when they're upset instead of saying, Mommy, you upset me because you changed the rules or you changed the schedule. And so again, I think it's really important to know that. We're not making excuses for that, but simply to be looking at it holistically, globally, that they're responding to something in their environment that doesn't make sense to them, that's making them particularly anxious, and it's our job to figure out how we can help them get through that in a more adaptive way. I'm glad you've brought up the issue of communication because we're going to move on to some of the issues with education and clearly communication is, is one of those. But let's start firstly with attention, mm -hmm. which is an important issue. So can you talk to us a little bit about the best strategies to improve and develop attention, particularly in young children? Mm -hmm. and, and attention deficit is one of the markers that we see in this population. Uh, it's been really researched very thoroughly. Of course, there is medication for those kinds of things, and uh, you would want to consult your physician on that. But generally speaking, in terms of the environment, we know that a child that's young needs to be focused specifically on a task one at a time, something that makes sense to them. If you have a lot in the environment, again, talking about the environment, that's distracting them and competing for their attention, you're really all bets are off. It's not fair because you're setting them up to, to fail. Yeah. So you want to have a, a place where maybe you're um, working on the attending skills and you're trying to increase the amount of time that they can do a task. So you might have a two-piece puzzle to a four-piece puzzle to a six-piece puzzle. Um, again, building on their, t their attention and then maybe two puzzles that are six pieces. You'll want to make sure that when you work and when you want the attention there, that there's nothing else getting in the way. So maybe cordoned off an area, maybe a desk, some place where it's not real noisy, a telly's not going in the background. Those are things that would draw their attention other places, and it would be unfair. So really what you're doing is you're changing the environment, and you're also helping them adjust to it in a way where they're adding more and more time to attend to a task. And that would be, I think, the best thing to start with. And, and back to communication, Dur during the workshops you mentioned that the ability to communicate is, is vital for people with fragile X. You know, why is this a and can you tell us about communication strategies um, that, that work for people with fragile X? Yeah, if you can't talk about what's going on or what's bothering you, um, you're really left with no other device than to act it out and to get your need met by engaging in certain behaviours. Uh, we know the kids that get frustrated with things often will bite their hand. They often will flap when they're excited. So they're communicating through their behavior, mm -hmm. but they're certainly not using words to communicate. We have this in adults as well, yeah. that adults maybe 
kind of gibber and um, they get kind of perseverative, in, when, especially when they're anxious. And they get very frustrated and embarrassed that they're not making their point known and, they, and they're adults and so they think, well, I should be able to talk like everyone else around and then they get very angry and upset and down on themselves. So we do lots of things early on um, if we know that the, the person is having trouble um, communicating, talking, basically. So the articulation might be impaired, but then also the message, the language part of it may be impaired. And sometimes we would use like a visual system where the child would simply, instead of pointing or crawling up on a cabinet to get what they want, they would have to exchange a picture to get what they want. We call it a picture exchange. And so they might have a photograph of drink and a photograph of chips or something, so they would hand it to mom and mom would then hand back the drink and that would be what they wanted at the time. We do that then on a, a bigger scale. Um, if they're not talking by a certain age, we might use an augmentative device where they press something and it talks for them. Or we might use a visual schedule that might just help them a little bit communicate. They may be making approximations of sounds, but we can't quite understand it. Mm -hmm. And so instead of frustrating them more and making them say it over and over and not really getting the, the word out, we would have then something else that was pictorial that would help them express what they really wanted. Because it, it, it's really critical that they're able to talk to us about what they They need to understand that language is a vehicle to get something. This is a big concept that they need to understand. Whether it's food, very primary, obvious things, or to tell us about their emotional status, or to tell us that they're really upset about something that's going on at work with the task itself, those are all critical elements of communication. And unless we start early on and they know it's a vehicle where I can get a need met, they'll never learn the lesson. So again, it's a critical piece of development, and I would suggest to parents that if you're limited in terms of resources, that the speech language issue is huge. And that's a place where, at the very beginning um, of the diagnosis, I would certainly access those, those particular services. Thank you. And we know that play skills are an important part of all children's development. How do you enhance play skills in children with fragile X? And that's a difficult one because a lot of times they're not interested in some of the things that uh, kids play with, for example. Or they want to spin something over and over again and that's more exciting to them than actually uh, playing with a truck in an appropriate way. So you literally teach how to play. Sounds kind of strange, mm -hmm. but you literally teach them an appropriate way to use the truck, an appropriate way to use the ball. And we do then, um, the exploration comes first, and so we're going to see if they explore toys, and then what they do with the toys after they get them. So that's something that we'd want to teach them. And then we start with turn taking. So they learn that reciprocation of I'm going to do it, then you're going to do it. Turn taking is a huge piece of any kind of, of play. And so once again, um, just taking it, breaking it down into little steps and being able to teach those things um, slowly. So we might with an adult take turns and then we introduce another child, they take turns, we go to board games after that. So there's lots of things that you would build on in the big picture to help that sort of back and forth reciprocation with play and social skill building. Okay. And, and do you see play being an important prerequisite for starting school? I think it's very important. Um, in the States, unfortunately, they've sort of lost track of the play, <laughs> I think. You know, we go right into the academics and they're writing uh -huh. stories in kindergarten, which I can't even believe. But I think, you know, play is really critical for um, interaction with other people. And kids with fragile X are very social and tend not to get diagnosed often with autism because of the social element. However, they have that approach avoidance. They have this thing about, I love to watch the game and I look really happy and it looks fun. And the minute we hand it over to them to say it's your turn is when they collapse. Because it's being on the spot. It's being um, the person now wants to, doesn't have, know what the expectation is. What do I need to do? So if I haven't been taught that and now they say take your turn and I have no idea what to do and there's other people around waiting and the attention's on me and I feel very embarrassed, there's going to be a problem. So again, I think teaching those skills in isolation are critical to just being okay as part of the, the, the classroom in general. Right, absolutely. 
So in the classroom environment, some children with fragile X tend to imitate mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on how this can be a strength, but also when it might become a problem? Sure. Well, imitation is great because it's the foundation of learning. And with some pop people of different populations and different disabilities, we literally have to teach imitation. So do this, and they clap. Do this, and they clap. We have to take their hands and teach them to clap. Kids with fragile X tend to be able to imitate quite well. Um, matter of fact, they'll imitate accents. They can imitate a teacher at home. They can imitate their phrases and everything that goes with it. Uh, so it's a good foundation for learning. You can easily say a do this, they can imitate it. You can say sounds, they imitate it. When it becomes a problem is when, of course, the model is not a good model and they're imitating certain behavior. And the hard part about this is maybe they're imitating a bad word and somebody laughs at it. Again, we have that antecedent. Somebody does something, they imitate it as the behavior, and the consequence is somebody laughs and thinks that's funny because this young boy is cursing. And now that becomes reinforced because the child feels like, oh, they, they, they think this is great. They think I'm doing something really fun. And instead of laughing at, uh, with, they're laughing at uh, this person. And so they may imitate some behaviors that are not appropriate. And they don't quite understand what's wrong with that because it's getting reinforced in different venues. And so again, the bad part of the imitation is that they may take on some behaviors that are not real good to imitate. And they don't have the wherewithal to understand that in certain venues they're appropriate and other ones they're not. So again, we have to teach that over and over again. And that leads to role models. So uh, inclusion or not inclusion, you know? Are we gonna put them in with kids that are all disabled that might have some other behaviors that they would imitate or some sounds that they would make or something else? Or are we gonna leave them in an environment where they have better role models? And that's, that's really a personal choice. We have to look at where they are in the continuum of things, but it can become a problem. So would it be fair to say that sometimes the environments that children with fragile X are in may need to change as, as they develop or if their imitation behaviors become more inappropriate? I think so. Um, we, I was asked this question during the seminar uh, related to do we include the child with typical peers or do we have them in a special school? Uh, and again, I think you're right. Developmentally, that changes. So we may want to have them included with typical peers when they're young because the gap won't be quite as big and they'll be more like their peers and we have a better opportunity of teaching that natural support because the kids are all there kind of doing the same thing. When they get a little bit older and that gap might be bigger, um, it may be more difficult for them to sort of fit in and they may in fact imitate some behaviors that are inappropriate. Teenagers, there's a lot of teenagers that engage in real inappropriate behaviors and um, they're thinking, well, I'm a, a teenager too, that's a cool thing to do. And yet, teenagers that are typically developing know when to sort of hide those things and when to show them. The child or the adolescent with fragile X would not know that. And so immediately they might be ostracized for that kind of behavior or they may be really labeled as a child that has a problem or that curses a lot when in essence they're just imitating something. So I think you do have to kind of look at that developmental trajectory to be sure when to include and when to pull back and do some special education around what's an appropriate interaction. Well that leads you know, very nicely into the, the issue about choosing a school. Mm. So when parents are, are looking to consider a school for their child, uh, what factors do they need to consider between choosing a main mainstream school or a special education facility? I think really what you want to do is focus on the needs of the child. So I would prioritize the needs of the child and I would be looking at, mm, is there basically need language? Do they need to acquire language? Do they need to acquire um, expressive language skills? Then the next thing on the list may be that their behavior is um, a little off and that they're having problems with their behavior. So if we're looking at those needs, the needs would then dictate, okay, the language issue. Where can I put my child where he's going to get good language instruction and have good language models? If that's the, the priority, Obviously, we're going to want them in a classroom that has less disabled individuals, so they would have those role models there. If it's behavior, 
um, it may very well be the same place for them. However, sometimes the behavior is so embedded that getting rid of certain things and replacing it requires kind of a special educator, somebody that can really go in and teach those things one-on-one -on -one or in a small group and help with maybe a curriculum that is specific to behavior. So I would say needs-based. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that even though we're including individuals, um, and, and sounds like it's the right thing to do because they need regular or, or normal peers, they're missing something too in the, in the special ed instruction because we can't replicate special education in a typical classroom. Then otherwise, why do we have both, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that if we are in fact looking at an included environment, whatever that child may be missing in terms of direct instruction, or prescriptive instruction from the special education unit, that that's not overarching, so that that's not more important than what they're getting and the benefit they're getting from being included. All right, excellent, thank you. It's quite common for children with fragile X to avoid certain activities. So, so why is this, and what advice do you have for teachers to help them identify this as a problem and then to manage it in the classroom environment? Avoidance is a big, big problem, and really it's a byproduct of the anxiety again. So if something makes us very anxious, we want to avoid it for sure. And our behavior is a way to get that avoidance need met. So for example, in the classroom, if uh, the child is really uh, doesn't want to write something down, for example, because of the, the motor planning difficulties, uh, they're going to throw the piece of paper or throw the pencil and at that very moment it sort of plays into their avoidance of the activity because the teacher will then time them out or the teacher will give a consequence around them destroying something. Um, and, and so again that's kind of meeting that need of avoidance. We have what we call approach avoidance where they kind of want to go but they can't, so they avoid. They kind of want to start but then they can't and they avoid. And so again, really what we have to do with that is to understand it first off because um, we need to know the activity and identify what's being avoided and why. It could be a social situation where the child uh, has to shake hands and has to look someone in the eye. We always tell teachers, do not force eye contact because with this population it's harder. Uh, for them to give eye contact than other populations. That's been well studied. So again, um, rather than put them in those positions so that they're going to work really hard to avoid it and that's going to become their behavioral repertoire, let's think about what's causing the avoidant behavior, what's getting in the way, what's making them anxious and what are they trying to avoid. And then come around the back door by saying, you know what, today a lot of times we'll do a side dialogue. Um, today we're going to have a change in plans. We're going to do this and then we're going to do this. But John isn't going to do that today. He's going to be able to go back and do whatever he wants in his cubicle. That right there would allow him to understand the situation in a way where he wouldn't have to act out to avoid the change. We've already done it for him. We've already said through this side dialoguing this is what's going to happen today. So again, I think just being really smart about what's causing the child to avoid an activity, mm -hmm. what's causing them to be anxious most likely because that's why they're avoiding it, is really smart. And then coming in with some strategies around, you know, you can do half of the sheet, you can do part of this a activity, uh, and then you can be finished for today. Or if this is going to be really difficult today, let's look at it tomorrow. What would you like to do instead? Giving choices mm -hmm. helps a lot because they can kind of put their schedule together. We call it forced choices which means basically there's four things I want you to do today. You can do them in any order you want. Here's the icons, put them in the order that you want. Those are th ways to kind of help that uh, child not have to sort of behave a certain way in order to avoid the situation. Fantastic advice. So what in, can you give us your insights as to how children with fragile X best learn to read? Yes, and that's being studied right now. Unfortunately, they're all anecdotal studies, but I'm working with a group of people who are looking at different kinds of reading material and what works best for individuals with Fragile X. We're looking at um, iPad applications. Mm -hmm. We're looking at visually based programs that are um, commercially made. We're looking at um, phonetics and, and really making sure that what we have seen works with these individuals pans out in terms of a clinical study. So what we know so far about the way they learn is that they're 
global, they're visual, they see the whole thing and not the parts. So that would lead us immediately to say, well, sight words, um, doing, you know, working through the visual system. Uh, memory is very good. The visual memory is extremely good with this population. And so again, why wouldn't we teach them that way? Now, it's not the perfect world because there's going to be words that are introduced to them that are going to be new words that they haven't seen before. And we can't teach every single word. That's why phonics then kind of helps out. But if we have word families, and we add a beginning sound, and that's all they're responsible for learning, then they can start to look at toy, boy, those kinds of words mm -hmm. that are visually related. Um, and that, that seems to be the best way to teach them. They learn faster, learning visually, um, whole word reading, whole phrases. We also really capitalize on interests, and that's really important. Because if the child is interested in the material, we're going to have their attention. And, and most of the kids um, have something that they like on television, a movie, whatever, a cartoon character. And so we can use that to build phrases, to build things about a movie, build phrases about a movie or something that they have an experience with. And that way they will recall and they will be able to read it. They get very discouraged when it's phonics, usually. Um, the sound blending, holding a sound and linking it to the next sort of relates to their language difficulties. That's all auditory. That's part of the reason for that. So we know that the visual system just simply is, is more intact and is a better way for teaching them to read. Okay. Well, what about maths? Because we know that understanding maths can be very challenging for many children with fragile X. What about effective strategies to te teach maths to our children? Math is tough because math in, innately is sequential. So when we count, we go from one to two to three to four to five. That's a sequential sort of thing. Um, but one of the things that we do use is, is sort of chunking and putting a group together. And so again, what you can do is introduce the number line, for example, to children, one through 10, and all the numbers on, on the line. And then having each one of those numbers on a sort of a, a template so that they can pull them off and put them into order. They're going to want to see that order. They want to see that whole global one through 10 look right. And so if you pull two out and then a five out or whatever, and you mix them all up, chances are, incidentally, they've they've learned that sequence just from the way it looks, not, not the counting out, but the way it looks. And so they're going to grab those numbers and put them into the right places because now it's going to look right. So that's the starting point for some of what we're doing with the math. Then we can start to look at um, addition and um, subtraction and those kinds of things related the same way. So they're learning their facts visually. Um, that's something that's worked really well. We have the math board that I've developed, which also gives them an opportunity to look at this side looks like this side, and this side is equal to this mm -hmm. side. So they look exactly the same. The equal sign basically says they have to match up. They have to mirror each other. They have to be twins. So two has to equal two, and so it goes. There's a lot of little gimmicks that we use just to make it more visual. Um, and then later on, with money and those kinds of things, we might do rounding up so that they want to go buy something and it's $17.99, uh, or let's round up what's the next biggest the, the uh, bill that you can find that matches it at the big, next biggest. Well, it's a 20. So the $20 bill is the one you're going to need to take to make that purchase. So we do little things like that to sort of help them along. It is just a very tough one. It's tough for the girls as well. Uh, they have a hard time with math. Ma matter of fact, many times they're not diagnosed until they get into a math class and they have lots of learning disabilities around math and then they send them in for more diagnostic testing and in fact they are fragile X, uh, either, well really mutation is, uh, full mutation is how we see those kids present. So again, just trying to figure out ways to kind of put them all together in a, in a picture, uh, dice is another way, it's a visual picture of what five looks like on dice. Um, so that we can kind of put that, the, the, the five dots with the numeral five, and then they can understand that is equal to that amount. There's just a number of ways like that that you might use. So this is a big one for us in Australia, but, but what are your thoughts on the role of homework for children with oh, fragile legs? Yeah. That's true. I, yeah. I, that's, that's an interesting one. So um, in the States, we don't make probably as big a deal of homework. Uh, but I think what you'd want to look at was, what is the reason for it? Why does this child need to do homework? If it is something that the teacher is assigning, 
and that child has to do what everybody else does and that's just learning that lesson so to speak that when I make an assignment you take it home and you do it uh, that may be an outcome that you want to look at I would rather look at it more around maybe learning kind of a work ethic so that when you go home and you have something to do you have a chore and you have a little bit of homework I would never make homework um, last for a long period of time because really um, the struggle that goes on in the classroom is just going to come home in the homework. If it's something that is an activity that's going to cement or to sort of reinforce what happened that day in school and we just need a little bit more time to sort of make sure it's solid, I'm all for it. I think if we just do homework to be doing homework because every other kid's doing homework and we have a meltdown on top of it and then we have the relationship with parent and child turning into teacher and child, I think we run the risk of really kind of compromising that relationship. So I would be real careful. I would, I would ask the teacher and teachers, I would make sure that you have a reason for assigning homework to an individual with Fragile X. Um, and that reason might be a good reason related to the work ethic, related to a reinforcement pattern, but always limiting the amount of time that that child is going to struggle with that. I think coming home, the child needs to have opportunities to get the sensory input. I think coming home, they need to have the opportunity to run and play and get some of the hyperactivity out of their system. And so to sit them right down at a desk again to replicate what they were struggling with at school, um, maybe holding it together all day to do, but now we come home and have to do the same thing, I would be real careful about that. And obviously there have been enormous strides in the use of technology in education around the world. What is the role of education, of technology, I'm sorry, in relation to the education of our children with fragile X? So we know that uh, things are, are working fast and furiously in this, this level of, of technology. And of course, all of our schools have smart boards and uh, different devices to help the uh, individuals with typically developing brains as well as the individuals that have disabilities. Uh, one of the things that really works well, I think, that, that we capitalize on a lot in the States is the smart board with a lot of music behind it because we know that these kids love music and it's a great way for them to learn. It helps enhance their memory because rhythm and music tends to do that. So again, um, being able to see an image on a smart board, being able to go and be interactive with it is, is very helpful so they can be moving things on a screen with their hand rather than the fine motor response of writing things. Sometimes that gives them kind of a, a leg up in the process. I think we have to be careful as well, and we would say this with typically developing individuals, that we don't want the child to uh, do only things on that are technology related so that they're sitting at an iPad or an iPhone and that's taking the place of an interaction that's really a babysitter in some ways. Uh, there's a time and a place for everything. So that interaction is really important. Um, using it as a tool to teach I think is great, but we want to be careful about using it too much as well. And are there any specific uh, applications or pieces of technology uh, aside from the smart board that you found to be particularly effective? Well, it was interesting because I, I have certain apps on my iPad and I thought while I was doing clinics, we'd try out a few and see if it was a cultural thing or if Australian kids would enjoy them as well. Uh, there were a couple of good apps around um, spelling that, that were helpful for them with moving letters with their finger into where the, where the letters belong. There were some um, writing apps where they were tracing and making letters that seemed to work really well. Of course, I had downloaded a couple of Wiggles, which they, they really enjoy here. And so the songs from, from the Wiggles, um, they really enjoyed. But I think you have to just kind of play that by ear based on interest uh, and, and to try to limit it to the educational component because some of the apps simply are not educational at all. And uh, again, I think that we might sort of get the brain accustomed to a lot of input, the visual, the auditory, and everything else coming in, so that when the child is in a classroom where that may not be available to them, they're tuning out because it's not enough arousal, it's not enough stimulation. So again, we have to be careful. Well, thank you, because you've got so many practical tips and pieces of advice there for, for parents and carers and teachers and anybody working with, with people with Fragile X. That's just fantastic. I'd just like to finish off by asking you one last question geared more for adults, mm -hmm. and, and, so, and it's about the workplace. So in your experience, what, what factors lead to success 
in the workplace for people who are affected by Fragile X? And this is a good one because I've been able, I'm old enough, I'm an old, old grandma type, <laughs> that's followed these kids throughout a lifespan. So I can kind of tell you, um, even though when they were younger, I might have predicted differently success for some of them, thinking that they were higher functioning and they would be more successful. And at the end, they turned out not to be the ones that were as successful as others. So what we've kind of accumulated through time is what predicts success in the workplace has to do with independence, for sure. Um, we definitely know that the more we're asking these guys to do on their own with the, the appropriate support, the better they're equipped to go into the world of work, the better they're able to understand a work ethic, the better workers they are. Um, it, it really starts from the very beginning of time so that when you have chores or you have a work, to, a job to do, that you're helping your child train through um, finishing something, getting it done and finishing something. Starting the executive functioning aspect of the brain is not always developed in Fragile X, getting started and finishing it out. Also the social aspect, because a lot of jobs have a lot of social components. And so if the child at an early age is never taught how to deal with the social environment or even to wear their sunglasses when they're in a social setting, that's better than dropping to the floor. Because as an adult, if you need to be working at an office and you need to be around other people and you can't manage that, you're not going to show up for work. That's going to be your avoidance again. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go into work because it's too hard for you socially. Another thing that comes into play is really um, the core strength, because we know muscle tone is really low with this population. Those jobs that require an individual with Fragile X to stand for more than four hours at a time or to walk or whatever, that can become debilitating because their core is so weak and they haven't been through exercise programs. They haven't done anything to build that core. Um, oftentimes they're so, sold short because of the fact that they could in fact do the job, but they can't physically manage the job by standing or whatever. So I think the independence piece is important. I think the work ethics piece is important. I think the socialization, I think the physical side of things is important. And that avoidance piece, not giving into that, at an early age will expand their repertoire, will make them more comfortable in a number of environments so that they can in fact do the job. We know there's some jobs that are very difficult for these individuals. We'd never stick them with um, real high-tech jobs or jobs that require a lot of fine motor control. Uh, those jobs just would not happen. However, some of them that are very successful have to do with animals, walking dogs, shampooing dogs, working in an old age home, serving juice, being a servant to others. They love that work. They love um, being important, I think, and having a special cooperative job to serve others is really critical. Sometimes the girls end up in nursery schools. They love to be with little children and they tend to do really well with them. So again, it's just kind of finding that niche in terms of interest and then going forward with it with these particular things in place that you're going to be working on along the way. Thank you. Well, Dr. Braden, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and, and on behalf of the Fragile X Association and the Alliance, our members, families, carers and everyone working with people with Fragile X Syndrome, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come to Australia, to speak at the workshops, to run the clinics and for being just so very generous in sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. You're most welcome and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Thanks.